Hymn number 244, please. 244, page 274. The gospel bells are ringing over land from sea to sea. Blessed news of free salvation do they offer you and me. We'll stand as we sing. Let's keep that good singing up. 244, please. Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. Let's unite our hearts together around the throne of grace. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for the gospel tonight. We thank Thee for that truth that we have sung about in John 3 and the verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank Thee for the gospel. We thank Thee uh, for the fact that it is sounded out from so many lips in these days. We thank Thee that there are many pulpits, many churches around the province, around the nation that still are 
uh, in that sense of the hymn ringing the gospel bells, telling others to flee to Christ while there is time. And we pray that this place, a money slain, would ever be a church that always preaches the gospel. We thank thee over its long history of over 50 years, half a century now. Thou hast been pleased to bless with uh, ministers and men that are willing to, to ring out the gospel, to preach the truth unto men and women in this district. No, oh God, we pray that that would ever be so from this pulpit, that the gospel would always go forth plainly and clearly, and that men and women, boys and girls that gather into these pews would be in no doubt whatsoever that they must have Christ if they long to possess eternal life. And we do pray that even if there be some soul in our gathering tonight that is yet without the Savior, yet without hope in God, oh, Father, we do pray that thou move thy Holy Spirit to press upon their hearts even tonight. We pray that the Spirit of God would open up their hearts to the truth of the gospel, that the blinded eyes would be opened, that the heart of stone would re be replaced with a heart of flesh, and that men and women would cry out, repenting and believing the gospel because of what Christ has done. We do thank thee and praise thee for the Lord Jesus Christ. We realize that when we think of his perfectly righteous life, it puts our wicked and rebellious lives into such a comparison, really, when we think of the beauty on the altogether loveliness of Christ and we think of our continual lawlessness. Oh God, we just praise thee for Christ. We thank thee for him. We realize that we were hopeless and undone, weak and pathetic in and of ourselves. We know that our good works could merit us nothing because even our best of works, our, our, our best of righteousnesses in that sense are but filthy rags, as Isaiah tells us. And we thank thee that we have one, the Lord Jesus Christ, that has and possesses a perfect righteousness and clothes his people with a perfect righteousness. And we thank thee for his death, his atoning death upon the tree, Truly, we can say tonight from this pulpit, wonderful truth, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all, not just some, not even the majority, but lose all their guilty stains. And we thank Thee for Calvary. We thank Thee for the blood that was shed. We thank Thee for all of the physical agonies that the Savior had to endure upon his body. We think of the mocking and the scourging. We think of the spittle in his face. We think of how he was beaten. We think of how he was treated as if he was uh, just a common criminal when he was and is the, the, the king of glory. As we consider that then they nailed him to that cross and he hung there for hours in the crucifixion. Oh God, we thank thee that he was willing to shed his blood, precious blood, powerful blood, divine blood, the blood of the God-man. We realize then that it wasn't just his physical agonies that he endured, but we thank thee upon that middle tree that it was upon his own body that he bore our sin, that he endured our hell upon his very soul. The Father turned his face away. Oh God, we praise thee that Christ was willing to face the hell and the torments that are merited to our account. And we thank thee that he paid a debt that we could never pay. And we rejoice in each one that is saved by sovereign grace even tonight. But, O oh God, thou knowest those that aren't yet saved. Work in their hearts. Show them that Christ is wonderful. We pray that they would taste and see that the Lord is good. And that they would know that there is no no disappointment whatsoever to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, O oh God, we ask that thou bless the congregation that have gathered tonight for worship. We pray undertake for every need, saved and sinner alike. We pray for those in the village of Money Slain that will hear the word tonight, if they so wish, on the loudspeakers that go forth into uh, the homes of many around this area. O oh God, we pray for those that will listen online later on in thy will as well. We pray that thy word would find a resting place in each and every heart that hears it, and that we would rejoice 
that the gospel has been successful afresh. We realize, O oh God, the gospel is always successful. Thou hast promised us that in Isaiah 55 and the verse 11, thy word uh, shall prosper in the thing where the two thou hast sent it. We know the gospel will be successful. But, O oh God, we pray that it wouldn't just be successful to the condemnation of a soul tonight, but to the salvation of many a soul we plead. O oh God, do it for thy glory's sake, and help us, we plead, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in this hour. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 228. 228. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give, tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Hymn number 228, standing after the introduction, please. Wonderful truth is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. The gospel is simple. I trust in a friend you would look and live even tonight. Now, turning in the word of God together, please, to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're going to read together the verse 11, beginning at the verse 11 and reading through to the end of the verse 20. If you're using a church Bible, you'll find the portion on the page 236, 236. But Deuteronomy chapter 30, in a moment we're going to be considering three words from the verse 19, and we're going to be looking at the title. Two words, simply choose life. Choose life, and that has been our theme tonight. Look and live, my brother live. But Deuteronomy 30 beginning our reading at the verse 11, please. Verse 11, Deuteronomy 30, the word of God states, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, 
and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his holy inspired truth to each of our hearts. <clears throat> At this point in the service, let me bid each one a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. It's good to see you, and we welcome those visiting with us especially, trusting the Lord will especially uh, speak to your heart tonight as you fellowship with us in Monish Lane. Now please remember for the week ahead of us on Tuesday is the Gospel Bus Meeting for the boys and girls at 7 p.m., then on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. That will take the form of a deputation meeting by Miss Joyce Walsh, uh, a child evangelist here in the province. So I trust you'll come and support her if you can. And then also Monday through to Friday this coming week, God willing, at 2 p.m. each afternoon, there is the five-day children's club in Drumlin Grange. And I trust that you'll remember that in prayer. And also, if you can, come along, support us, help us. Uh, and come as a worker. And even if all you can do is, is sit there and be among the children, that is a great help because we need adults there if the children's meetings are to go ahead. And also, if I could just thank the one that uh, gave the sweets. There was a, a big bag of sweets hanging on my gate when I gave, came home uh, after the morning service and those that donated the sweets for the five-day club. Whoever you are, we thank you in the Saviour's name for that as well. But then the services next Lord's Day, <clears throat> morning worship at 12 noon, the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., and both of those meetings preceded by a half hour of prayer. And I trust both morning and evening you'll come for the times of prayer. We need to pray. I need you to pray. Pray that the Lord will bless as we preach the word on the Lord's Day. Then today as you leave is our retiring missionary offering, and let me thank you once again for the maintenance fund offering they came to £365 last Lord's Day. Please continue to remember the gospel mission planned for uh, Sunday the 10th through to Sunday 24th of September in the church hall here. Please continue pray, to pray for it, uh, that the Lord would soften hearts in advance for the mission. Also, as you leave, is the TBS quarterly magazine, the Ulster Bulwark. And please do continue to pray for those in the church family that are not too well at this time, they're sick, they're laid aside, those that are shut in, and of course those that are bereaved of late, and even as the months pass, even though others may, uh, may slip the mind of others, it doesn't slip the mind of those that are bereaved, so I trust that you'll remember them and pray for them. We are a church family, of course, but all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we'll have our offering hymn now, 248, 248, page 276. Under the burdens of guilt and care, many a spirit is grieving, who in the joy of the Lord might share life everlasting receiving. Life, life, eternal life. Jesus alone is the giver. Life, life, abundant life. Glory to Jesus forever. We'll keep our seats for the first part of this hymn while our tithes and offerings are collected. 248. <laughs>
Amen. Now, we're turning in the Word of God back to that portion we read earlier, please, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and the verse 19. Verse 19, and we will be taking as our subject the three words we find in the end of that verse, but we will look at all the verses that we read together. But Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, we'll read it again. Very solemn verse. Please do give due diligence to it as we read it. It says, this is the Lord speaking through Moses. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Solemn words, aren't they? We'll repeat them. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Therefore, choose life. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Let's ask for the Lord's help upon the message tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for the gospel. We thank Thee that in Thy mercy and love and in Thy grace there is the option of life open unto us. Oh God, because of our sin we deserve death, eternal death, hell forevermore. And we don't deserve a choice in the matter at all. We don't deserve the option of a saviour. We don't deserve the option of the shed blood. We don't deserve the option of life. But we thank Thee that now that option is open unto us, that door has been opened. And we pray that there may be men and women tonight that choose life, that choose Christ, that choose heaven. O oh God, give wisdom in the decision that is made by each one, even this evening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in the UK last year, there was an estimated... 570 million patient interactions with a doctor, a hospital, or the ambulance services. Let me just say that again. An estimated 570 million patient interactions with a doctor, hospital, or ambulance just last year in only our nation. That's approximately... 1.6 million people needing some form of medical intervention every single day in the UK alone. And I know many in this congregation were a part of those figures as well, going to visit the doctor or the hospital or something of that form. And many of those individuals in those figures were faced with life-threatening issues, hoping to find help, hoping to find medical treatment. But I ask the question, why did each one of those 570 million patient interactions even take place? Why did they take place? Well, it's very simply because individuals realized they had a problem. They had something that would cause pain, discomfort, or even possibly death if left alone. And ultimately, all of those patient interactions were on one basis that each one chose life. They chose life. They needed some sort of medical help. They wanted their life to be benefited. They chose life and they went and sought out help. They chose life. And ultimately, you say, that's a very simple truth. And it is a simple truth. You have a life-threatening illness. You have a life-threatening uh, accident happen. You choose life. You ask for help. You ask for people that know what they're doing, and hopefully they will help and, uh, God willing, spare your life. Well, here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we find the same situation. The same situation uh, spiritually laid before the children of Israel. The children of Israel are told there is a problem. A sin problem. Only a little word, S-I-N, sin, but a massive problem. A huge illness that has plagued man from the beginning of time when Adam rebelled against the Lord. We are all sick with sin, but the wonderful truth is in Deuteronomy 30, there is hope. 
There is one that has made an intervention. There is one that you can go to. There is one that you can approach. And it's better than a doctor or a hospital or a paramedic or any like that. Who is it you can approach the Lord Jesus Christ? There is hope. But the point is, every single one of us in this gathering are sick with sin. And I ask, will you do the logical thing, the thing that the Lord expects of you, And will you choose life, eternal life, spiritual life, life in heaven forevermore? Because that's the choice that's laid before the children of Israel here in the verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then the appeal from the Lord, verse 19, Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So I ask, not about the children of Israel, what about you and I tonight? As we hear that sin leads to death, as we lead, uh, learn that Christ leads to life, as you know that there is cursing and there is blessing, there is hell and there is heaven, there is sin and there is righteousness, there is death and life, which will you choose? I plead with you, listen to the words of the Lord, therefore choose Life. Every single one of our hymns tonight has been about choosing life. Life, life, eternal life. Jesus alone is the giver. I trust that tonight you will choose life. Now I ask, are we wise enough to choose life? Because nothing saddens the heart to hear the gospel going forth. And men and women hearing the gospel and knowing the gospel and knowing of Christ and knowing of Calvary and knowing of uh, death and life and the choice before them and yet leaving through those very church doors once again rejecting Christ for another week. I ask tonight, are we wise enough to choose life? I want you to note three things about this portion in Deuteronomy 30 and I'll outline them for you now. The word is near. The word is clear, therefore choose life. There are three points. One, the word is near. Two, the word is clear. And three, therefore choose life. So number one, the word is near. The word is near. Look with me in the verses 11 through to 14. We see this. It's interesting. We'll read verse 11 at the moment. It says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. You find here that that the gospel is near. The gospel is accessible. The gospel can be heard. Yes, the option of life is there, but it's not hidden away. It's not hidden away in a closet. It's not hidden under a bushel. That's what the old song and the Bible verse talks about, not hiding our light under a bushel. But, but it's near. It's approachable. It can be had. It, that choice can actually, in reality, be made. It's not just theory. It's not something in a textbook. It's not something that's not real and actually airy-fairy and away from reality. But it's actually real. And you can tonight, in reality, make this choice because the word is near. But let me make something very, very plain tonight. Very clear indeed. We have all sinned against God. We have all sinned against God. And in doing so, it is us that created the distance between us and God. We created distance. We went the wrong way. We have distanced ourselves from God. Here we find in the verse 11 that even though we did the running, even though we were like Jonah and we ran away and we tried to run from God and we tried to go as far away as possible in the opposite direction, isn't it a wonderful mercy of the Lord that still the word is near at hand, that still the gospel is close? There's many that have tried running from God for many a long year, and yet tonight you find the gospel is close at hand afresh. Come with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 in the verse 6, it details something of how we have tried to distance ourselves from God. And it's our sin that has caused that barrier. It is our sin that has caused that great gulf between us and God as we find ourselves in our sin. And Isaiah, 
Isaiah 53 and the verse 6, familiar words <clears throat> to most, I would imagine, and those that are sheep farmers here or all of us in the countryside know what sheep are like, how so easily, if not attended to properly, they can escape, they can run, they can get through the littlest hole in the fence because they like to go afar, they like to distance themselves, they like to, in their foolishness, go astray. And Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the point is, we created the distance. In our sin, we have been the ones running from God. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 talks more a little about this. And, and it's wonderful, really, exposing us for who we are. Because we don't like to be exposed. We don't like to be criticized in our nation. We are a proudful people, aren't we? And in our hearts, we, we don't like it when criticism comes. But Romans 3 leaves us exposed as to our sin. And of course, the verse 10 tells us none righteous. Verse 11 tells us none understandeth, none seeketh after God. But look at the verse 12. This is the problem of our sin. They are all gone out of the way. We have created the distance. We have gone the wrong path. We have gone in the opposite direction. We should be on the broad, uh, on the straight and narrow path, but instead we chose the broad road with the rest of the world and we desired the things of it and we're heading to a lost eternity in hell and sin. That's what the word of God says. They are all gone out of the way. And therefore, verse 23 applies of that same chapter, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as a consequence of our sin, stay in Romans 3, look at the verse 19. We often look at these verses, but solemn verses, because of our sin, because of our lawlessness against God, because of our commandment breaking, we find that we will stand before the judge one day. And verse 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, look at it, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What's that mean? If you stay in your sin, you will be examined. If you stay in your sin, you will stand before God at the great white throne of judgment. If you stay in your sin, you will have no defense whatsoever. The only thing you can say is, I am guilty as charged because I ran away from God. I decided I wanted to reject Christ. I created the distance in my sin and it was all my fault. And all the world may become guilty before God because we are guilty. We're guilty as charged and we deserve hell. But that's the wonderful truth of Deuteronomy 30. Come back there with me. In spite of the distance in our sin that we have created, we find the word is near. The gospel is near. Look at the verse 11 again of our chapter. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. Neither is it far off. Truly, we can say in this province of all nations around the globe that the word of God is very near. You can't even drive down the road without seeing the gospel on a tree or a lamppost or some uh, gospel text somewhere. You don't have to go into church to see the gospel. It is everywhere in this province. The word is near. But I ask, will you continue to reject it? because it's not hidden and the gospel isn't far off. You may try and create as much distance between you and God as possible, but the word is near. Look at the verse 12. We find the Lord gives us examples here. He says in the verse 12, it is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Now we find in, in his lack of mercy, because the Lord had every right, of course, he could have left the gospel in heaven. He didn't have to send Christ. He, he didn't have to send hope. He didn't have to send mercy or pardon or love. He didn't have to do that at all. He could have left every goodness that we can have tonight. He could have left it all in heaven. He didn't have to show us any of it. In his word, he didn't have to give us Christ. He didn't have to send Christ to die upon the tree. There didn't have to be any shed blood. The Lord could have just damned us to hell immediately. That could have happened. 
We find the Lord says, no, it is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up to heaven for us? No, because it's near. Look what it says in the verse 13. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. So no, the Lord isn't the one creating the distance. The Lord isn't the one that is making the gospel difficult or complicated or too hard to accept or, or anything like that. No, we find it is very nigh. Look at the verse 14. It gets closer. It says, but the word is very nigh unto thee. Isn't it interesting how the verse 11 says, this commandment which I command thee, this day it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. But it, it talks now, the language of the portion changes. It says it's not hidden, it's not afar off. But then look at the verse 14, it is very nigh. It is very nigh. In fact, it's not just close, but it's very close unto thee. And look how close it is. Verse 14, in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. You see, you don't have to even come to church to hear the gospel and know that you've offended God and broken his law because the word of God is actually written upon the hearts of every man and woman, uh, man and woman. And I tell you this, the gospel couldn't get any closer than being engraved upon your heart, could it? You say, what proof do you have of that? Come with me to Romans again, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and we find the word of God agrees with itself. Once again, preaches this same doctrine, that the law, the word, is very, very near. In fact, so near, it's not just near as close as you are to the pulpit sitting tonight. It's not just that close. It's not as close as you get to a signpost as you drive past it on the road. But it's far closer than that. It's in your heart. And Romans 2 and the verse 15 says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You say, what proof is there that it's written on my heart? Well, the word of God tells us their conscience also bearing witness. You ever done something wrong? In your conscience, you didn't need anyone else to tell you. In your conscience, you knew you did wrong. In your conscience, there's that alarm bell going off and you say, I know I've done wrong. I know I've done wrong. Some men think, right, I'll confess my sin. Some men say, I'll hide my sin. I'll cover it up and hope no one finds it. But all of us have a conscience bearing witness to what fact that it's already written in our hearts. That Deuteronomy 30 is true. That the gospel is not afar off, it is not hidden. In fact, it's not just near, but it's very nigh. It's in our mouths and in our hearts. And I tell you, friend, it's surely proof of Psalm 106 and the verse 1 that we examined this morning, that the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. What a mercy it is that the gospel is that close to rebellious sinners. But well, then I want you to note not only the word is near, but secondly, the word is clear. The word is clear. Look at the verse 15 with me, please, of Deuteronomy 30. Verse 15, it says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I don't think you could get a clearer sermon than that, really, could you? You know, you can hear some sermons, and maybe you say it's like me, I don't know, but some sermons can be very unclear, very complicated, very la di da and over people's heads. Well, the Lord doesn't preach sermons like that. He says, see, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. It really couldn't be plainer. Are you going to choose life? Because in life there's good. Are you going to choose death? Because in death only evil awaits you. And that's the truth. In life, there is the goodness of heaven. In death, there is the evil of the torment of hell forevermore. And the Lord makes it perfectly plain, perfectly clear. The gospel is not complicated. The gospel is very, very simple indeed. Let's examine that second part for a moment. When it says in the verse 15, death and evil. Death and evil. Well, is it true? Come with me to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. You know, before Adam even sinned, as soon as Adam was put in the garden, Adam was given a warning. Adam was given a warning that if you sin, death will follow. 
If you sin, death will come. And sure enough, it's exactly as the Word of God says. Because even before the fall that we read about in Genesis 3, we read in Genesis chapter 2, God's warning. God has always been beating the same drum, the same clear message. It is not complicated. Genesis 2 verse 17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And die they did. Adam isn't here anymore. Eve isn't here anymore. They're in their graves. Many are in their graves. You look at every major town and city, and all of them possess a graveyard. Why? Because the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And true enough, it happened. Came to be. Come with me to Romans again. Romans 5 and the verse 17. Romans 5 and the verse 17. I, I trust we're making this clear that because of sin, it leads to death. And this is a clear message. It is an uncomplicated message. Romans 5 verse 17 tells us, because of what Adam did, because of his rebellion in the garden, because he ate of the forbidden uh, fruit, it says, Romans 5 17, for if by one man's offense, that's Adam's offense, death reigned by one, that's what we read in the Scriptures. Look at the verse 12 of that same chapter. Wherefore, as by one man, as by Adam, sin entered into the world. And look at it, what follows from sin? And death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Look at Romans chapter 6 and the verse 23. This is plain as day. For the wages of sin, the reward for sin, the payment for sin, the end result of sin, for the wages of sin is death. And this is what God has been warning about. Warning about from the very earliest chapters of Scripture. Sin leads to eternal death. And if you live for sin, then, as our verse says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, death is coupled with evil. There's nothing good there. There's nothing uh, pleasurable. There's nothing favorable. There is nothing good in it. Death is coupled with evil. Life is coupled with good. And what evil awaits you if you stay in your sin? Is it just physical death? No, it's far more than that. It's spiritual death, eternal death, and hell forevermore. Look at Rome, uh, Revelation, sorry. Revelation 20 now. Now I want you to see this. And you say, okay, preacher, and I've heard this sort of language from people, and they say, I'll take my chances. I take my chances. The choice is before me. There's heaven, there's hell, there's, the, there's life, there's death, there's good, there's evil, there's, there's the choice before me. And I've heard this sort of uh, language where people are willing to play Russian roulette with their souls and gamble it away and say, I'll take my chances. Well, friend, there's no chance to take at all. Revelation 20 in the verse 11 and following talks about the great white throne of judgment tells you exactly what you are heading for in your sin. It says, verse 11 of Revelation 20, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. You see, when you get there, you'll want to hide. You'll wish you could run away. You'll wish in that, in that fearful torment of the great white throne of judgment, you want to just scurry away in the corner. No big men are found then that day. But there's no place found for them. It says in the verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Doesn't matter if you're the richest man in the world or the lowliest beggar in the world. All in their sin will stand before God. And we find that the books will be opened. And the evidence will be heard. And then look what we find in the verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. Death all the time. Death is the key. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, right throughout from Genesis, the earliest chapters of Genesis, right to the very last chapters of Revelation, all of it really comes down to this same choice that is found in Deuteronomy 30 in the verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. The choice is there, life and death. Which are you going to choose? Because if you stay in your sin, it's death, it's evil. That's what awaits. But then look back in Deuteronomy 30 in the verse 15. It says life and good. 
life and good. Well, what's that referring to? Well, we find, interestingly enough, that when we choose life and good, there are certain things that are expected of the Christian as well. Maybe you're a child of God here tonight. You say, okay, I've chosen life. I, I praise God and I remember the day when I chose life by the power of the Spirit of God. I did that in March 1999 and I've been rejoicing ever since. But what's expected of the believer? Look at verse 16. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. I ask, could we do that better, believer? Could we love our God better? Well, that's a challenge to us, isn't it? Look at verse 16 again. To walk in his ways. I ask, could we obey his word and be holier? Could we? Could we be better at that? And to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. Oh, that we would just not only live, but multiply spiritually. See souls saved, be soul winners for God. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Of course, this is a promise to Israel, but apply it that we would possess money slain. Why? Because we loved God and walked in his ways and kept his commandments. Surely there's a challenge there for the child of God. But what does it mean, life and good? When it says in the verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. What is the life then that we are talking about? Oh friend, it's not just any life. It's eternal life. Life in heaven's glory. Life with the Lord Jesus Christ. All oh, the comparison could never be truly made when you think of how dark and wicked hell is and terrible the plight is that those that face hell and the lake of fire have and then the glories of heaven and Christ and the saints and the mansions and the streets of gold and oh friend, there isn't even a choice to be made hardly. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. Come with me if you would to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we find time and time again the word of God refers to life and eternal life to boot. It really is wonderful. John 3, look at the verse 15. We know the verse 16, but look at the verse 15 to begin with. It says there, John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not have death, should not have hell and the evil that accompanies it. No, but have eternal life. Then verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not have death, should not have hell, but have everlasting life. Time and time again, it's just a choice of one of two places. It's not as Rome would tell you. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no other made-up fictional place. But it's one of two places, heaven or hell. It's either life or death. Which will you choose? Look at John 5 and the verse 24. John 5 and the verse 24, seeing as we're so close to it. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, hath what? Everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You see it, friends? It's wonderful. The choice is there, but you can choose life today. Come to John 17. We're still so close, so we'll look at that as well. John 17, and look at the verse 3. Once again, life is on offer to your soul. And it says there in John 17 and the verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Maybe you say, okay, preacher, you're talking about life. How do I get this life? You say, I want to choose this life. How do I obtain it? Well, the answer's there in John 17, verse 3, is it not? And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Christ is the way. Christ is the truth. Christ is the life. In fact, come to John 14. John 14, verse 6 details that. You want life tonight? You want to avoid death? You want to avoid the punishment for sin? You want to avoid the wages of sin, which is death? Well, John 14, uh, verse 6, the Lord says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And you say, well, can you give me a little more detail as to this life 
this eternal life. Does the scripture say much more about it? Does it give more detail? Does it fill in the gaps in that sense? Well, look at John 14, verses 1 to 3. You want to know more of this life? It says in the verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Listen to this. Wonderful. Oh, Christian, at times we've lost the, the awe of this. This is where we're going to believe a sinner, friend. This is where you can go to if you choose life. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, the where I am, there ye may be also. It's very simple. It's very simple. But ultimately, it's very important. You say, it's such a clear choice, such a simple choice, such an uncomplicated choice. I tell you this, it's the most important choice you will ever make in your, your soul for all eternity. You say, I make important decisions in my life. Some of them we get right, some of them we get wrong, don't we? But you say, I'm going to buy a car. You say, it's an important decision. I'm going to buy a house, or I'm going to get married, or I'm going to do this or do that, or plenty of important decisions in life. I tell you this, the most important decision you can ever make is choose life. Choose life. And I want you to note as we come back to Deuteronomy 30, not only the word is near, not only secondly the word is clear, but then thirdly the appeal from the Lord. And it is a solemn appeal. Verse 19, therefore choose life. Look at verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, Blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life. Well, I trust tonight that I too, through the Lord's help, as I have laid before you death and life. And I appeal to you, choose life. Therefore, choose life. This is very solemn. Verse 19, Almighty God calls for witnesses. You think of that. You think who God is for a moment. God is the omniscient one. His understanding is infinite, we read in the Psalms. It doesn't need witnesses. He is the judge. And yet we find that there will be plenty of witnesses against you if you go all the way to the great white throne of judgment. Oh, we find, yes, it is enough that the Lord is against you, of course. The Lord is witness to all of your sin, but there will be plenty of witnesses too. There will be witnesses. If you're a sinner here tonight, sitting in Monish Lane, Free Presbyterian Church, and maybe you say, I don't want that Christ. I don't want the Savior. I don't want Calvary. I don't want the shed blood. I don't want any of it. You say, actually, I'm going to choose death. I'm not going to choose life at all. You go all the way to the judgment before God. And you know what? This preacher will be called to the stand to witness against you. And every single person in these pews sitting around you will be called to witness. That's what you were told at that gospel meeting. And there will be witnesses against you. Look what it, verse 19 says. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. You think the whole of heaven are listening, are listening right now to this sermon. Dr. Douglas talked about that when explaining angels. And he said, our eyes have been shielded from the glory of the fact that there are angels all about us. Well, there are plenty of angels here. There are angels in this meeting tonight. And they're witnesses they're witnesses that I'm doing my job right. There's witnesses that you're listening. There's witnesses to the decision you will make. And the Lord will call the whole population of heaven. The angels and the saints that have gone before. And he'll call all the witnesses of the population of earth to record. To say, this is what you've heard. This is the decision that you have made. This has been laid before you, the gospel that is very nigh and very clear to boot that I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. That's a solemn truth. The fact that there are so many eyewitnesses to what you will decide to do tonight. And I trust that tonight you will come I trust that tonight you won't go through those same church doors and reject the Savior afresh. But that tonight you will choose life. Choose 
to re reject death, reject hell, reject your sin, and choose Christ and Christ alone. Because that's what you need. You need what Christ has done upon Calvary's tree. You need the blood. You need the Savior. Choose life. Come with me to Isaiah 55 as we close. Isaiah 55 and the verse 11. And Isaiah 55 and the verse 11 is one of those verses that I like to refer to as the preacher's friend. <laughs> the preacher's friend. Because it encourages the preacher when at times there's no encouragement on offer. And it's the preacher's friend. Because it reminds me, as it ought to remind you, that every time the word is preached, whether there is a response to it or not, that the word is always successful. It is always successful. And Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. That's something we need to stop and consider, surely. You know when you hear the gospel and it's very nigh and it's very clear and the choice of life and death has been set before you and a man has pleaded with your soul to choose life, that word is not word that is just going out of Daniel Henderson's mouth. It's going out of the Lord's mouth to you. It's the Lord's word to your soul. And it says in the verse 11, It shall not return unto me void. No sermon is wasted. No gospel opportunity is wasted. No gospel track is wasted. It shall not return unto me void. Verse 11, But it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. But you see, the solemn truth about that verse is it doesn't mean every time the gospel is preached that souls will be saved. It means every time the gospel is preached it will be successful and prosper in whatever the Lord wishes it to be successful and prosper in. You say, what does, what does that mean? It means that if you choose to reject life, reject Christ, reject heaven, that you heard the word. And the word will be a witness against you and condemn you when you stand before God at the judgment. That's solemn. But the gospel will always be successful. So I plead with you tonight. Are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? Because it really is as simple and as plain as that. You say, how can I choose life then? You've appealed, choose life, choose life, choose life. I don't know, you could go back and listen to the recording how many times that word, that phrase has been repeated over the course of half an hour. Choose life. But you say, how? How? Isaiah gives us the answer again. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. The Lord gives us the answer in Mark. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's how you get right with God. You, you turn from your sin. You, you reject your sin. You say, no more for me is the things of this world. And you say, I'm going to believe on Christ. I'll take Christ. I'll trust Christ. And I'll choose life. I trust that each one tonight as you realize there are many witnesses around you, there are witnesses on earth, there are heavenly witnesses in the form of the angels listening and watching you, waiting upon a response, but everyone will make a choice tonight. If you choose to leave without the Savior, you choose death. If you choose life, you will repent to believe right now. But verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death Blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. We're going to close with the hymn number 232. Hymn number 232. O sinner, the Savior is calling for thee. Long, long has he called thee in vain. He called thee when joy lent its crown to thy days. He called thee in sorrow and pain. Sinner friend, listen to these words in the chorus. O oh, turn, turn while the Savior in mercy is waiting and steer for the harbor light. For how do you know but your soul may be drifting over the deadline?
tonight. 232 will stand as we sing. there's one here and you have any questions maybe you'd like to be saved tonight you'd like to speak more about these things stay behind friend choose life don't leave still facing death heavenly father we pray that thou give wisdom to some man some woman some young person to choose life tonight to choose christ to prepare for heaven and home we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>